her virtual welcome. Tracy, how are you? Hello, doing great. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, before we start, uh, would you like to talk a bit more about your background, the, the sort of uh, work you do and uh, the sort of books you like? Yeah, so I'm an editor of adult fiction across genres, memoirs, and young adult novels. I'm a writer myself with many stories and essays published, and I have my Master's of Fine Arts from the University of Baltimore. I also taught writing at the University of Baltimore, um, and I worked for a literary agent, and I've been doing one kind of editing or another for about eight years. So recently, I've been seeing a lot of epic fantasy with ensemble casts and multiple points of view, just like Game of Thrones, which is so controversial recently with that last season. I often use Game of Thrones as an example when I write to my clients, and I thought I should share some wisdom. Say what you will about the final season, the books have a lot to teach about multiple point of views. Now, I read every single one of the books a long time ago, and recently I'm just finishing listening to the audiobook of the second. Uh, so this webinar is going to focus mainly on the first book, which is called A Game of Thrones, not quite the same as the TV show, uh, but that's what I'm going to spend most of this time on. Um, spoiler warning, I already covered that. I'm not really planning on talking about the end of the TV show, but it could come up. Uh, first, what is multiple point of view? When multiple different characters take turns narrating a novel, as they do in Martin's Song of Fire and Ice series. Um, I also want to note that while these types of ensemble casts happen a lot in fantasy, this webinar should help with other genres too. Um, an example of a multiple P POV YA thriller is Karen McManus's One of Us is Lying. Um, I also really like Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which is an epic sci-fi, and a lot of the POVs in that story are from spiders, so read that at your own risk. Um, so the, while the main focus of this webinar is on fantasy, it should help anyone who wants to write multiple points of view. So here are the five main topics, can't see my, my pinky, that we'll cover. How to choose which character narrates a scene, how to decide whether a character deserves to have a POV section at all, how to avoid confusing your readers, how to choose between first person and third person, and how to make each voice distinct. Well, let's get started. First, choose the right character to narrate a chapter. Note that I will talk about chapters here, not scenes, as Martin only changes POVs between chapters. That's a good strategy, as readers can get whiplash if you switch too quickly between narrators. I normally encourage writers to choose the character who either has the clearest goal, has the most to lose, changes the most, or drives the chapter with their actions. If a character meets all of those criteria, that's great but they should ideally at least meet one. So try not to choose a character who's just going along for the ride or watching the action, unless you have a really good reason to do so. For example, in A Game of Thrones, in the very first chapter, there are many characters who will ultimately have point of views. But Bran narrates, and if you've seen the end of the show, maybe you think that was planned far ahead. While he seems to be going along for a ride, to watch an execution, his role is actually more complicated. He changes the most in the chapter, as he's probably the only one there who's never seen an execution before. So he's the most affected by the action. He also has a clear goal not to embarrass himself in front of his father and the rest of the party. Um, he would lose his respect if he cried or um, turned away. And then after the execution, the group finds direwolf pups, and Bran's goal is to convince his father to let him keep the pups. He wants the pups more than anyone else there. He has to speak up against multiple other characters who think the direwolf pups should be killed. So he does drive action that turns out to be very important to the book and series. All right, on to the second item. Ensure point of, ensure point of view characters deserve to have a section. So any character that has a POV section, for the most part, should have a clear character arc and goal in the book. 
One of the most common issues I see with multiple POV books is when a character gets a POV scene and then they don't appear again in the books. Authors sometimes do that to show situations where the main characters aren't present. This can be frustrating because readers get invested in a character who narrates a few sections and then disappears because they're not needed for the rest of the book. Also, readers care about those big action scenes that we love so much in fantasy because they care about what's going to happen to the characters. If you swap to a character readers don't care about to narrate a scene that's supposed to be high tension, you'll probably ruin the moment. Of course, this doesn't mean all your narrators have to be good guys, and that's one of the things George R.R. R. Martin is awesome at. He makes us root for the bad guy. Though in the first book, we don't really see a point of view from anyone who's obviously a villain. Catelyn blames Tyrion for Bran's attack. Remember that uh, dagger that shows up again, so some theorists say. Um, but because we also get Tyrion's point of view in the first book, readers know Tyrion is probably innocent and didn't cause the attack. It's hard to be sure. Now, that doesn't mean you can never use a one-time point of view. A Game of Thrones does this in the prologue, which establishes the threat of the others, who are known as White Walkers in the show. However, we're not left wondering what happens to this one-time narrator for too long, because Ned Stark executes him in the first chapter. Martin doesn't do this too often. In the Battle of the Whispering Wood, Martin uses an existing narrator, even though she's not in the thick of the action, instead of switching to a one-time narrator, just for the point of showing readers the blood and gore. The show didn't often make that same decision. So remember, we're talking about novels here and not screenwriting. Uh, Catelyn Stark is the one who narrates the Battle of the Whispering Wood, even though she waits it out in hiding. The battle comes almost at the end of the first book, and Catelyn is the only character there who's had previous point of view sections. Show watchers might not realize that Rob Stark never has a POV section in the books, and Martin doesn't make an exception just to put the readers in the middle of a battle. In my opinion, it's better to stick to an existing POV character than to create an entirely new one um, or to use a character who's already in the book but hasn't had a POV. While Catelyn can't really take action in the Battle of Whispering Wood, she does have a lot to lose. Her son's life and potentially her own life and the entire war. Avoid creating new POV characters just for the sake of action, world building, or dramatic irony. In the vast majority of cases, those characters should have their own arcs. When you're trying to figure out how many point of view characters to have, keep Martin's numbers in mind. He had nine point of view characters, um, including the prologue, and this book is about 280,000 words. Um, there are conflicting viewpoints on word counts in fantasy, but remember that Martin had published many books before Thrones came out. I think a debut author is going to have a hard time traditionally publishing a fantasy book that's too far over 150,000 words. Uh, the, you'll find different opinions on that. Can you do justice to almost 10 point of views in a book that's only around 100,000 words? I'll leave that to you to decide. So moving on to the third point, which is of course connected, um, avoid confusing your readers. One of the hardest things about writing multiple point of views is helping your readers, and let's face it, yourself, keep the point of view character straight. Sometimes this comes down to cutting or limiting point of views, or making sure your story takes place in one geographical location and in one timeline, at least to start. So Thrones has nine point of view characters in the, first, in the first book, but every point of view character, except for Danny and Will from the prologue, starts the book in one place in time, at Winterfell. This makes it easy to keep track of who is who because we're getting to know the same group of characters, even though we have multiple point of views. And we also don't have to keep track of different time periods or different places. In future books, obviously, they're a lot more sprawling and Martin adds more perspectives. But we've had 280,000 words to get to know the core cast, so that makes it a little easier to follow along. 
Uh, the readers do still get confused, and Martin still hasn't finished the last books, so maybe he's confused too. Once you're sure that every point of view character deserves to be there, and you've taken steps to make it easier for readers to get to know them, you should also find some easy ways to clue readers into who the narrator is. One obvious way to do this that most writers of books like this do is to label each chapter with the narrator's name. Martin does this, but you may have noticed as the books go on, he does use aliases as his characters take on new identities. And in A Dance with Dragons, he doesn't include the character names in the table of contents because that could be a spoiler. However, just labeling each section with the narrator isn't enough, especially when people are reading ebooks and audiobooks and they don't have the benefit of seeing the character names at the top of each page in the headers, which some print books do. Later, we're going to talk about how to keep each character's voice distinct, and that's one way to help your readers keep track of who's narrating. You should be able to flip to any page and pretty easily be able to guess who's narrating because their voice is unique. However, the first few sentences of each chapter are the most important to help avoid confusion. They should very clearly orient us in that narrator's point of view and tell us a little bit about where the narrator is in space and time and what they're doing. We'll talk about writing in third person versus first person next, but one of my favorite tricks in a third person book is to simply use the point of view character's name before any other characters in the chapter and make it clear that we're getting their perspective. So let's look at some examples. I'm going to read some quotes. So this is the very first page of chapter one, not the prologue, and Bran is narrating. The morning had dawned clear and cold with a crispness that hinted at the end of summer. They set forth at daybreak to see a man beheaded, 20 in all, and Bran rode among them, nervous with excitement. This was the first time he had been deemed old enough to go with his lord father and his brothers to see the king's justice done. So Bran is the first name that's used. And we get his emotions, which is a clue that he's narrating. We get what he's doing and when he's doing it, the end of summer. We also get why the book starts here. This is Bran's first beheading. So kind of like a Westerosi bar mitzvah. I don't love that the book starts with weather, but since the stark words are winter is coming, I'll forgive it. So let's do, um, I've got two more examples here. Second one from chapter two, it's Catelyn. The first sentence is Catelyn had never liked this godwood, godswood. So we get her name first, we get her emotion, and we get the location. Uh, the next example in chapter three, and that's Danny's point of view. Her brother held the gown up for her inspection. This is beauty. Touch it. Go on. Caress the fabric. Danny touched it. The cloth was so smooth that it seemed to run through her fingers like water. So in that section, everything is seen through Danny's point of view. We get her brother and then her name and emotions. It can be a little harder to do this in first person, which leads into our next section, how to choose between first and third person. So let's start with first person, uh, Martin's in third. So a recent fantasy book that did first person multiple point of views well comes from the young adult world. Um, first person present tense POV is really popular. So this book is Tomi Adeyemi's Children of Blood and Bone. Um, I definitely recommend it if you like Game of Thrones. Um, however, Adeyemi only has three points of view in her book. So that makes the task for her as an author and for the readers less challenging than following nine point of views. First person point of view um, adds a sense of immediacy and it makes your readers feel like they are your characters. Personally, I love uh, both writing and, and reading first person point of view. However, it can be really hard to differentiate your narrators when you have multiple first person points of view. It's challenging to create even two unique voices in first person, much less four, five, or ten. I'd suggest starting with third person if you're going to build an ensemble cast because it will make it easier for your readers to keep track of who's narrating. If you choose first person, you can do it, but you're probably in for a challenge. 
you can still make your readers feel very close to your characters in third person point of view, but sometimes authors get confused about how to do this. One issue that trips authors up is when to switch to first person and use italics to show character thoughts. The answer to that, in my opinion, is don't do it. <laughs> don't do it much at all. Martin does this, but he does so extremely sparingly, and he mostly keeps character thoughts in third person. For example, this is an excerpt from when Catelyn's watching over Bran when he's in a coma. She had been shouting, she realized with a sudden flush of shame. What was happening to her? She was so tired and her head hurt all the time. Now, what I see a lot in client writing is something like this. She had been shouting, she realized, with a sudden flush of shame. Start the italics. What is happening to me? I'm tired and my head hurts all the time. And italics. Now you can do that, and in some places Martin does, but it's pretty rare. Uh, that's because every time you ask readers to swap back and forth between first and third person, past and present tense, you risk breaking them out of the story. If you find yourself doing this, I'd say even once a page, consider whether you might feel more comfortable drafting the book in first person. I even know writers who draft in first and then switch to third person when they revise. And that's uh, actually pretty common. It's a painful edit, but it's, it's common. All right, on to point five. How do you make each voice distinct? So not only do distinct voices help keep your readers from getting confused, they help build your world and make your characters memorable. You wouldn't have BuzzFeed quizzes about which character you were if the characters weren't extremely distinct. I'm Aria, personally, I think. No matter whether you use first or third person, each narrator should have their own distinct voice that's informed by their background and culture. Think about your character's religion. We saw Catelyn thinking about the gods would, um, their family and their values. Martin does a great job of creating distinct voices and leaving room in those voices for characters to change and grow. For example, to continue um, Danny's first POV scene, she thinks about that dress. Um, this is so bizarre when you think how the show ended. This is what she thinks. She could not remember ever wearing anything so soft. It frightened her. She pulled her hand away. Is it really mine? So can you imagine season eight, Danny being frightened of a dress? Martin sets up her character arc and even this tiny detail, how she interacts with the dress. This is her starting point and oh boy, will she change. Second, we already have a sense from this short excerpt of what Danny's life has been like. She's been on the run, begging for help, and unsure that anything is really hers to keep. So let's compare Danny to Sansa, who's close to her age in the books. In Sansa's first POV section, she feeds her dire wolf bacon at the table, and her dire wolf took it from her hand as delicate as a queen. This shows that Sansa values del delicacy and sees a queen as delicate. I don't think that season eight Sansa would agree. So here, already, we're seeing her character arc. What shows her as different than Danny is that when her septa chastises her for feeding her dog at the table, Sansa says, she's not a dog, she's a dire wolf. Sansa has had the kind of loving upbringing needed to speak up for herself, whereas Danny has pretty much only known cruelty and hardship. Beyond paying attention to how each character views the details of the world, one trick Martin uses is giving his characters catchphrases. The obvious example of that is all of the house words. Winter is coming for Stark, fire and blood for Targaryen, and hear me roar, which is the Lannisters' official house words, but we've probably heard of a Lannister always pays his debts more. But that doesn't really help when so many characters are from one family, especially in this first book. Beyond the official house words, we hear Arya frequently saying phrases she learned from Sirio Pharrell, the water dancer. Quiet as a shadow, calm as still water, and one of my favorites, 
fear cuts deeper than swords. Then there's Jon Snow. He often thinks about how he's bastard with lines like, there were times, not many, but a few, when Jon Snow was glad he was a bastard. A bastard. So we can kind of know that it's Jon Snow if we see him connecting everything to his station in life. Um, that excerpt was from when Jon Snow was allowed to drink at the feast while all the Stark children had to behave like little lords and ladies. Eddard, a phrase that he repeats, um, is the promise he made to his sister and what she said to him. Um, so he'll sometimes say, promise me, Ned, when he thinks about that. So while building distinct voices infuses every single word of a story, using catchphrases is a good trick that makes Martin's characters even more memorable, and it happens to be good for merchandising. See it on t-shirts. That is the end of our five points. So here's a quick recap with key takeaways. Uh, one for each chapter, does choose the narrator who most deserves to have the point of view. Two. Stick to your main point of view characters. Avoid unnecessary point of views. Three, on my fingers, make it easy for your readers to keep POVs straight. Simplify your story and give lots of clues. Four, choose first or third person, depending on how many point of views you have and how you like to write character thoughts. Five, make each voice distinct with attention to detail, character backgrounds, and catchphrases. And that wraps up everything I have to say so far on writing multiple point of views, the Game of Thrones way. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, Tracy, what sort of um, books or projects are you looking for right now? So, um, Obviously, I love fantasy and working on epic fantasy like this. Um, I also like working on a good memoir, science fiction. Um, I do a lot of contemporary young adult novels, and I love those. If you have anything with animals, I love animals. Um, anything high tension and thrilling. Amazing. Cool. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for spending this time with us. It's been really, really useful. Uh, rest of you folks, uh, if you think you missed anything, I'll be sending out a transcript and a replay in just a few days. Uh, thank you very much for turning up uh, and making this such a great one with your questions. Um, if we didn't answer any of your questions, hopefully we'll get back to you. Uh, just pop them along or ask us on Twitter and we'll do our best to answer. Uh, thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, thank you. Yeah, have a great evening. See the rest of you guys. Have a good one. Enjoy your Wednesday.